drone company Mavinci in 2009 and was there responsible for Mavinci desktop development. Uh, for those of you who have not heard about that company and software, we developed uh, our own fixed ring drone, everything from the scratch as it was usual 15 ish years ago. Uh, our own autopilot, um, yeah, our own flight control, a desktop control system for mission or flight planning. Um, we got pretty good in flight planning, and um, that was one of the major reasons why we got acquired by Intel in 2016. Um, so they were mainly interested in our flight planning capabilities and in our ITK for the drones. Um, and then we basically took this project. I, until then, developed more or less on my own. Uh, and basically, the plan was to write a totally new user interface. So we ripped everything apart. Uh, first did it externally, didn't went so well. So then we did it again <laughs> with the team where Jan, um, was also a part from. And yeah, that went until I would say beginning of 2020. We had uh, support for the Intel Falcon 8 Plus uh, copter drone. So basically during that Intel time, we extended the capabilities more and more into the copter direction while we originally started from um, fixed wing flight planning. Um, yeah, and, and in 2020, basically the project was stopped and we got Intel convinced to donate the entire code base. Um, so what you can already hear from what I'm telling you is that the code base had a lot of major changes and in the, its oldest parts, it's kind of 13 years old. So it's a bit of a mess in some places. There are a lot of nice code parts. The problem is it was always stacked on top and yeah, I think one of the major uh, tasks for the team would be to clean this up. And we have so many interesting things in the pipeline I will talk later about, especially uh, Jan had some really nice contribution which hasn't made it yet to the main line. Um, yeah, but let's get started. I have um, the Intel original software running on my computer here. I will start sharing my screen. So you can see what I see. Um, I'm demoing Intel Mission Control and not Open Mission Control, since Open Mission Control uh, kind of got running the first time yesterday night. Um, and most of, yeah, uh, thank you, Jan, and thank you, Michael Strauss, for last night's effort. Um, the problem is, it's some of the resource folders are still missing, so we have to ask Intel for some other files or basically or otherwise have to come up with all strings new, all icons new. So please stand, stand, stand by for just a bit more time then we can uh, go with open mission control. I will also the later in the demo switch to open mission control and show you the differences what we did it edit later. So this is a software, it's based on a 3D globe and a Java FX user interface around it. Um, it's at the moment entirely Windows based, but as I said, Java FX, so it could also run on Mac and um, Linux as MaVinci Desktop was doing in the past. But with Intel, we mainly focused on Windows. So the non-Windows support kind of got removed over time. So this globe here in the middle is um, an open source project from NASA. It's under nowadays Apache license. Um, it's also, I think, a 20 year old project. They did really, really cool stuff. Um, yeah, so uh, let me just zoom somewhere where you have some 3D impression. Yes, it's full 3D, as you would expect. Um, but we did some more cool stuff with this. Let me, for example, zoom to one city of Germany where I imported a data set. Uh, where is it? Oh, there. And this data set was created by our um, Sirius drones then. And you can see it loading live, but in principle, it's um, a tiled uh, mesh model. Um, geo-referenced by uh, KML files. So this is about, I think, five-ish gigabytes and several 10,000 of files, um, kind of half a city, I think around one square kilometer where you can zoom through. And 
all this 3D globe, and I will show you later some more, uh, we basically use for having a good geo visualization. Uh, in principle, we can also load um, yeah, geo tiff files for imagery reference. Let me see, this should be in Lorsch. So I, I have shown you the how we can import even complex um, geotiffs. Um, no, that's the wrong gosh. Um, so we can also load geotiff files for elevation support and for imagery support. And I think the geotiffs I have loaded here. They are only two and a half D, so buildings look a big bit uh, shady. <laughs> um, but also here we have an entire city in a resolution of I think five centimeters loaded, theoretically. So it's still really fast. Um, we can import also let's say single objects like where is my favorite one. This data set we created with a uh, Falcon drone, and it's basically adding a 3D bridge into the normal landscape. So if I'm disabling it, so you see this is kind of what you get vanilla, and we could add something, some object like that. Beside this, we so we can import uh, KML geo um, uh, geotiff files. We have WMS server support, so you can connect to kind of every imagery server in the world. We have air spaces included uh, based on air map. If you have a license key, we have at the moment uh, map box background layers. If you have a license key, um, and yeah, we can also do something like control lines and, and whatever. So it's a uh, quite nice map background. You can also do the entire coordinate system planning in whatever coordinate system you prefer. So there's an EPSD database in the background. So it's very prepared for being a full geospatial software. Um, so, but let's, let's start with some real projects. Um, I have something prepared here for you. Here's a list of recent projects. Let's go with that one. And there's a flight plan I created. Ah, that's boring. Let me create a new one. So um, my favorite example is the city of Heidelberg because I'm living very close by. So if you want to do flight planning, which is a major, major feature of the software, um, typical workflow is you selecting a drone. Uh, at the moment, we have only the Intel drones in this release, but in the upcoming one, we have also description, I think, for all DJI drones. Um, let's go with a certain drone and let's start planning. So it asks you for what kind of mission structure behavior you want to have. So there are, let's say, two-dimensional types and three-dimensional types. Um, everyone, uh, let's, let's start with a polygon. So by just clicking the polygon here, I think that's what everyone knows. If I'm Kai Kenny did it afterwards, and it generates you some flight lines. Um, each flight line has here a line pointing to the ground, showing you the direction of the camera. So we are supporting drones which can adjust camera orientation, like copters. And we're also supporting drones like fixed wings, which are not so flexible in adjusting heights or in adjusting camera directions. So in principle, in this hardware description I just showed you, you can in, it's a JSON format, sorry, or XML format, I don't remember in detail, uh, where you can specify what is your drone and your camera and your lens and whatever capable of, and you get flight plans like this. Um, so, and you did this, you can add corners and whatever. Okay, um, but what happens if this flight plan is, let's say, in the side of a hill? So we selected a, a copter drone and what he's doing, he's adjusting the camera orientation to tilt it against the terrain. Uh, it's the moment. Let me remove a couple of flight lines. Let's make it way smaller than it should be way better visible. Uh, 
So as you can see, it's always uh, pointing perpendicular to the terrain. And the distance of the image triggers on the terrain is equally distant, but not in the air. So you get a perfect overlap. So everything is optimized for getting really, really good photogrammetric results. Um, speaking of which, you may have seen that we're doing this greenish color coding here on the train. So what's that? Um, if I hover with my mouse over it, you can see the small tooltip, pre-flight estimation, 14 images overlap, 10, 10. So we're basically projecting each and every image to the ground and estimating the overlap we would get at that point of, uh, spot of the train. Here, for example, you get only five images. Uh, which is normally still good enough, but the problem is you get a, five images from one flight line um, since the center flight line is not reaching far enough to the outside. So we're estimating this as bad quality. Here at the uh, top order, you see something like one image. So he can give you estimations. Um, so the polygon we use for planning here in the center has... Oh. Should be somewhere here. Um, okay, Marco, would you prefer would you prefer questions while you're going along or at the end? Uh, I'm open for questions. Please, please go ahead. Okay. Um, just um, I was curious earlier what makes up a drone description when you had that list of drone descriptions, and Paul had a question in the chat about whether this particular drone that you're using tilt the camera to point at perpendicular to the terrain. Um, sorry. Uh, so. Let's start with the drone description ones. Uh, let me just show you drone description. Okay. Um, I was partly curious as to whether it's something we could pull out of the RG pilot parameters or whether it's like a, a JSON file that people would create for their vehicle. Um, is there some sort of editor for these descriptions? Um, so first of all, do you have a hint for me? How can I hide this uh, Zoom title bar? Or is it going away on its own? Um, uh, Jan, did you remember where the hardware descriptions are placed? Otherwise, I'll also have a look. I, 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 I found the original one through sources. No, I found the um, There's uh, Intel Mission Control, Source Main, Java, Com, Intel Mission Control, Hardware, and then there's all the Java files for those descriptions. Mm -hmm. there it is. Yeah, um, at the moment, I think, so let's say the description folder is one of those which is missing at the moment, which Intel forgot to donate. Um, let's start with, I don't know, the Intel Falcon 8 Plus description. Um, so you have something like, okay, name, ID, some legacy, like how to connect to that, what image should he use? But here it gets interesting. Maximum line of sight in meters, uh, plane speed, uh, plane speed max. So how fast can you fly? Do you need a certain overshoot at the end of line or is the drone overshooting lines? How early does it start to turn? So do you have to extend flight lines or not? Uh, mm, angular speed noise. So is there a certain rotation noise on the drone we have to compensate for? Maximum angular speed. So you see there's yeah, a lot of numbers. Is fixed wing, is copter. Then you have like, how is the payload mounted uh, relative to the drone? What are the compatible cameras for those drones? And then in the cameras, again, you have a list of, of lenses. Um, in principle, it's, it, it should be very extensible. And uh, this is how it is at the moment. Mm. Yeah, that looks really quite detailed. Yeah. And yeah, we, as I said, we use it for a lot of automatic flight planning. Um, yeah, here you can see what axes are fixed on the camera. So what is the gimbal enabled to rotate and what is the gimbal not enabled to rotate? What are the maximum gimbal angles? Uh, is there a certain offset in something? Uh, what is typical exposure time? Uh, you name it, there's plenty of stuff in there. So the resulting flight plan then presumably would include the desired pointing angle, or is it a region of interest, like a ground point region no, of interest? Or so let's let's export the flight plan. Yeah, yeah. Let me. Uh, okay, sorry. This version is not. 
but okay, we can do it this way. Okay, here's a list of, of generated waypoints out of mm -hmm. this uh, com computation. I see, it's got the camera angle. Image, you get latitude, longitude, altitude, above reference point, above takeoff, above, uh, above ground. What speed should you have at that point? How long do you should hover there? Zero means just fly through the camera orientation and should you take an image or not? Right, yep. You yep. see there are even some additional points added for getting the turns right. We, um, yeah, you can have a uh, random text at those points. Yeah, yeah. So we, um, yeah, so it'd be interesting to see how we can fit that into the, the mission structure that we have at the moment. Um, because we'll need, we'll probably need some additional mission items, uh, which contain the the, the camera uh, data. Uh, most of the rest, the the heights and things, that's that's all just part of our standard mission now, and the hover time is part of standard mission. Um, the desired flight speed being part of the mission is different from how we do things at the moment, um, but. Um, we could have like a, a meta waypoint. I'm just sort of thinking out loud yeah. at the moment. Randy may well so chime in. Basically, what what we do um, before before I continue, do you have a hint for me? How can I hide this this toolbar? We don't we don't see the toolbar at the top, uh, ah, so absolutely. it doesn't worry okay, us. I got it. Okay. Anyway, um, yeah. So um, just just a question, just sure. Trish, why is that camera stuff a problem? We can control the mounts, pitch and roll in your yeah but synchronized with the waypoint so it's basically saying it wants the camera to be at this angle at this waypoint it wants to be doing that speed at that waypoint i'm not quite sure how we synchronize that in our mission um uh because the, the like the the mount takes time to turn so do you sort of set it at the start of the previous leg or I'm just no, as soon as you we execute all do commands, which is a do command, as soon as you exit a waypoint, it'll move yeah. it to the uh, the new position, which may or may not be what you want. Yeah, it might not be. You might have to have some intermediate ones because but, your shutter could still be going from the previous but, photo. Yeah. So maybe let's let's I let I think we can can do there something. And also basically the software was built to be very, very flexible on, on a lot mm -hmm. of those. Uh, yeah. for example, with uh, uh, zero drone. We uh, so with a fixed wing, the the logic on the drone was you just say like okay I need images in at least this distance and at most that distance starting right. from here to there. So you yep. give gave a, little, a certain degrees of freedom to the drone, and we just did a let's say worst case estimation on the, the desktop software. Yeah. And the background for this was you just saying here's a window of opportunity. Take a picture whenever you're ready and whenever you are steady. Yep. Yep. <laughs> So don't yeah. like if you're in a full swing by, maybe wait a half a second <laughs> before you get a motion blur picture. Yep, yep, makes sense. Yeah, uh, sorry, uh, uh, please go on. I was just sort of thinking yeah. through how we'd adapt this into the RG pilot world. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, as you maybe have seen before, we have a lot of, let's say, geometric primitives, but let me, yeah, we'll basically just go through through the main idea. So for each flight plan, you get here a summary, like what is the time to flight, what is the flight distance images, and you see you can edit the images. You can make mass editing, uh, like, uh, I don't know, you can filter for things and say, okay, I want to, to all selected points, I want to add something. You can do really fancy stuff with that. You can like invert the selection, there's like, uh, select in waypoints with warnings. I will show you what warning means before uh, and, and things like that. It's um, a very, very manual way of editing, but yes, it's also there if you really, really want to do that. Um, but I'm oh, basically, let, let me do something. I will just delete a certain point. So what we see now in the lower corner, there's a warning. Ooh, why is there a warning? Let's click there. Or oh, will not get full true auto coverage, estimated only 80.8%. Uh, you see the true auto coverage. That is basically the amount of the polygon we specified as the goal area, which is green. And here in the lower bottom, I think there's some percentage which is not perfectly dark green, but pseudo auto quality, yeah, it's 100% because everything from the polygon is covered. And additionally, we also get the area. But back to the warning, it just tells me, yeah, it's not perfect. And there's a second warning. Flight lines are not computed automatically. You want to enable it. So there's 
interactive warning with fix me option. So if I click on it, it's fixed. And yeah, if you now go back to the menu, it's back to automatically computing things. Um, and the warning I just showed you is just one of those. Like, yes, do you want to compute waypoints automatically, um, flight behavior, follow train surface, or just fly straight? If you're flying straight, uh, you're flying straight into the mountain. That's maybe not that nice. And you see, oh, there's a lot of more warnings. Minimum altitude is minus 55 meters. It's too close to the ground. Your minimum distance, it's a parameter of the drone, uh, is at three meters. And then there's a resolution difference. Like, yeah, the, the minimum and maximum resolution is more than 30% difference from what it should, obviously, because we're coming very close to the ground. So you can change the flight behavior or can say like, ah, I don't care. You change the flight behavior, everything is good again. Um, ground speed, we can make it automatic. We can make it, uh, what is automatic fixed? I don't remember. You can set it manually. So let's, uh, let's fly, our drone fly really, really fast. Oh, it's only 10 meters. Um, selected overlap is beyond uh, capable. Uh, on capabilities at the speed. So the problem is 80, uh, 80, probably is 0. Point something percent more here. So he's even warning you like, okay, I'm flying so fast, my camera can't trigger fast enough, it will go wrong. So you will get a bad result in the end. And again, he uh, suggests you like either go slower or just accept it. And if I say go slower, my speed is not 10 meters, but 9.8 meters a second. Unfortunately, I can't entirely break it since the limit here for this drone is 10, but we can do something else. We can say, ah, the resolution should not be 1.3 centimeter, it should be 0 0.5. And da -da, you get a new flight ground distance, you get way more waypoints. The speed is probably way too fast for the drone. Yeah, at this speed, the camera can only do 56% overlap. So either fly slower or accept the overlap. Um, then we have a very detailed height concept. Um, so all drones I saw so far, and probably you're way smarter than me at this, uh, drones are referencing all the internal heights to wherever they're switched on, and this is zero height, and then everything is referenced to that point. That's what we saw most. And you can now uh, put here a, a takeoff location, like, okay, this is the spot where I want to take off. And then all heights are referenced to that point in the export. Internally, we're computing in global altitudes. But for whatever we're writing out to the drone, we can say like, OK, everything should be referenced to that spot. And if you connect the drone to the software, it will automatically adjust it at the moment when you transmit the flight plan. But since we also can, let's say, create flight plans ahead of time, export it to SD drive, and we can't check it. Um, yeah, so there's uh, takeoff position hardware, I already told you, but it's, yeah, it's entire, uh, what else? So we have for the polygon here, a lot of additional properties. As I said here, minimum is like resolution and distance, which are coupled to each other. If you're changing one, the other one is changing accordingly. Um, and for the polygon itself, we have a lot of settings like overlap, uh, in-flight direction, parallel to flight direction, way, uh, order of waypoints, where when you start flying, um, typically there's some auto magics here, but you can also force it to certain things. You can change the direction, like uh, best suited for terrain, then he will just fly as most up and down as he can, at least for a copter. For a fixed ring, <laughs> it would be just flying as constant heights as you can. So he already knows what kind of plane you have and then adjust the um, flight direction accordingly if you want. Um, like this would be a, a more fixed wing like flight plan for the same. You can add some camera pitch like if you're for whatever reason want to have your camera pointing some degrees forward, you can do that. Um, you can just do additional uh, orientation or adding to the mouse outer lines that you're going to always get shoots into the polygons. Um, you can just say, please toggle my camera. One second. Um, I think it's hard to see. Mm -hmm. Let me change something. 
So this settings basically means please alternating adding plus and minus and plus and minus 45 degrees, um, which could be really good for getting really awesome 3D models, uh, including all the textures and facades and whatever. So basically the gimbal goes ent the entire time back and forth um, and, and things like that. You can do that also with the rotation of the cameras. Um, we can have default values for all of this. You can make it your all own default values. You have a lot of ways to setting up your own structure on this. So this was just polygons. A typical flight plan can contain more than one area of interest. Uh, where, where is it? Add area of interest. So let's, I don't know, adding a square spiral. So now you have like two area of interest types, square spiral. I think the name is self-telling. I think you're often using that kind of pattern in search and rescue, starting at the center and just flying spirals until the battery is empty, recharging and then continue flying outwards. And you can have multiple of those in one flight plan. So now we're getting even more warnings. Uh, line of sight is too long for this type of drone and things like that. Uh, everything what is red here, let's, let's hover over it. It's too high over ground. Here's a class uh, airspace where you're only allowed to fly in that area 99 meters over ground or less. So he's highlighting that in red. So he's doing a lot of background checks all the time. Um, and it's also quite extensible. And as you see, it's all those checks and warnings are kind of calculated not in time, but let's say with half a second delay. So it's not slowing down your software while you're using it, but it gives you an update of whatever you have in front of you kind of instantaneously, um, which is a nice balance between performance and now oh, let's go here on the other side of the valley, uh, performance and getting real time insights in what you're doing here. Okay, um, let's do a new flight plan. As I said, we have here, what else do we have? City grid. Let's do that as the last one. And I think I saw the city grid feature on your base latest mission planner announcement. So basically it's just flying two grids in 90 degrees rotation or, um, to, uh, relatively to each other. And if you combining this with um, adding some tilt to your camera, you're getting really good facade imagery. Yeah, that's kind of what it's good for. And that's also kind of the way how we did cities. Um, okay, so this was more the fixed wing-like stuff. Unfortunately, I have no fixed wing drone in the software at the moment, but let's go for the more drone-ish things. So let's start with a simple tower. You're giving a center, you're giving a radius, you're giving a height of the tower and uh, you're telling him what resolution do you need at the tower surface. Let's go with something incredible, small. And then he's adding as much as you need photos, flight lines and whatever. And also here you have thousands of more parameters. You can adjust like what is the flight pattern? What is the rotation? minimum maximum distance and so on. He's also taken into account that you can't go as close as you like to the ground. So the lower part of the tower is, uh, we're doing as good as we can to still cover it. So we just, uh, if we are at minimum flight altitude, we go, uh, tilting camera down and going closer to the tower. So we got kind of comparable results. Also here you see some warnings. Ah, this is too close to the tower which is obviously the case. So it's not conflict-free planning. So you can give in values which, are, which make no sense, but he's still computing it for you, but at least he warns you. Next step would be that he's even avoiding stupid things entirely on its own. Partly he's doing that, but not entirely. So tower, let's go for the next one, um, building, which is basically a polygon and he's just going around that polygon. Yeah, so basically he has a polygon to cover the rooftop. He has, is going around the facades 
always taken care. He's having perfect overlap at the facade and not equidistance of the drone flight lines. So the drone flight lines get different distances at the outside, especially for corners. We're making sure that photogrammetry is not breaking. There's typically a constraint of about 15 degrees between different flight lines. Uh, so 15 degrees, your differences at different flight lines. So photogrammetry is not breaking. You can for sure adjust this as well. Um, so another, there's facade, which is basically, yeah, like the building, but yeah, just one wall, or if you also, if you like, you know, to get multiple wall, walls with corners and whatever. Um, we also have under the hood, something like a fully parameterized uh, 3D windmill. Um, so you can enter the blade length, you can enter the hub diameter, the tower height, the orientation, and he's doing an inspection flight pattern around that. Um, so there's a lot of those things, and maybe now is a good spot to highlight what Jan was doing, but it's not integrated yet. In the next version, you can, so we, we have the code yet, but it's not integrated in the user interface. Uh, just load any arbitrary mesh or 3D structure with undercuts, however you like, like a bridge, like a windmill, like a, I don't know, big, expensive object you want to inspect. I don't want to name things. Um, and just uh, crop out a certain section and tell it like, please cover it with that resolution. And he's computing perfect flight lines and minimum, yeah, with no collision, with perfect overlap at the object, with all the photogrammetry constraints. Um, that won't be that instantaneously, but Jan, do you want to tell more about that? Yeah, basically it does exactly what you said. Um, you load in some kind of mesh, I think an OBJ mesh, and it would just basically cut up uh, the whole object into flight line layers, and then it will just fly around it and taking into account that you want to have the same coverage at every point on the object. And, you know, it also uh, supports a little bit of the weird shapes, like if you have a bridge or so, then it will normally fly around every pillar of the bridge. That's basically it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm really curious if we get that integrated. We, we kind of playing with that kind of technology for the last, I don't know, five-ish years. Uh, I think 2016, I like, first started a bit of that, but Jan really, really made it way better. Um, we even did a keynote about that. So if you look for AU VSI 2017, I think it was 2017, uh, we, we demoed kind of that on the big stage. Um, you can find that on YouTube. Um, okay, so this is flight planning. Um, as I said, there's a lot of warnings we do in the background, like estimating speed of camera, motion blur, uh, overlap with airspace restriction zones, with terrain, uh, maximum line of sight. I don't know, there's, I think it's 30 different checks we're running entirely uh, all the time in the background. And for each, of, for most of the checks, we're even simulating the entire trajectory and driving the checks based on, on that. Okay, um, so next step would be normally um, that you, after planning, you, you throw out your drone and, and fly. I will show you that in a second because it's not part of Intel mission control in the released form, but it will be part of open mission control. Uh, let's first go to what you do after the flights. After the flight, you have a data set. And I will show you a bit of what we have here. Um, so basically after the flight, you can typically have either a set of images with proper EXIF metadata with um, orientation and latitude, longitude and everything inside. Or after the flight, you have um, one folder with images and a log file, and you have to bring that together. Um, we basically supporting both. How do you time synchronize between a log file and the images? Um, sorry, can you repeat that? How do you time synchronize between the log file and the images? Because very yeah. often there's a bit of a, a, a time skew yeah. between the two. Yeah. So basically we have an estimation algorithm because next problem is like if you have a time offset, you have some stretching in time, yeah. maybe a bit. Yeah. You have drift um, with slightly different yeah, clock rates. Yeah, and you have uh, very often like 
losing images like you think yep. you triggered an image, but you have not. Or sometimes there's an additional image because someone put it on their SD card because he thought it was part of it. Yep. So even the amount of images doesn't match. And also typically in exit metadata, you have only integer seconds. And on your log files, you have, I don't know, microseconds, nanoseconds, whatever. So this is all the problems we also encounter. And we basically um, have an algorithm which kind of tries to find a perfect matching between them, minimizing the time jitter in the offset. And it's- So it's doing that by examining the images themselves? So it's it's trying to do the, the matching of the images itself? Um, right, okay. Yeah. yeah. And it works for most of the time very well. Mm -hmm. But let's say in 1% of the time or corner cases, if something is somewhere broken, it's con computing forever and not coming up with any results. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so it's not perfect yet, but I know that with an our drone team, it was a hell of a relief after we, we basically brought in that to the team by the Mavinci acquisition, because everything they had before was way more bad to use. Mm. So it's already very smart dealing with missing images on, up, on I don't know, a couple of percent of the mound, dealing with too many images. Uh, basically, we even calibrating different cameras because we saw some cameras have a behavior that they're kind of buffering images. And due to mm. that buffering, they're using the timestamp not at the trigger point, but at the writing point. And then mm. you have a buffering jitter as well. And that gets really messy. Mm. Yep, nasty. <laughs> Nasty. Um, so, okay. For whatever reason, this is not showing you what I wanted to show. Um, let me restart. Um, I think we just encountered a problem. So, basically, next would be, as I said, um, matching images with the drive, so you either importing SD card with already metadata inside, or you just telling him, okay, here's a lot of files, maybe multiple, here's the images, uh, please do your magic. And um, then it copies over data, maybe downloads it even kind of on the fly from the drone if it's necessary. Okay, let's go back to the data sets. Okay, um, so basically every red triangle here is um, um, image position. So now I am a bit bad luck because for whatever reason, he's not showing me the ground preview. Okay, this is the demo effect. It worked yesterday. So normally what you should see is that, um, Oh, like this. <laughs> so, um, right. So you're getting in the background, all images projected on the ground in a really, really re low resolution, which helps you to see like, okay, have I actually flown the area I should fly? Sometimes you get from your customers like a uh, map, please fly that polygon, uh, please fly this building. Then you, or let's say this construction site, and you look on Google map where that is. Uh, plan your flight, but actually the construction maybe have moved. They are now building two weeks later somewhere else. So it's good after the flight to have a quick check to see, oh crap, I wanted to capture this island here, but the island is at the corner. So I have to do some additional images. You should see that before you go home and having this quick preview really helps with that. You can zoom in and the most center image is giving you in full resolution. So you don't even have to the problem is the full resolution loads a couple of seconds per image. So you don't even have to open it externally in enemy image viewer. What you still could do with the right click, he's just showing you the images most under your cursor. Um, so you can do that kind of stuff. Um, what else can you do? You can also, for other kind of lights, you can't project it to the ground. Let's say if you fly around a tower, you can just show individual images hovering in the air and yeah, for a keynote, so, we already integrated it, but one of the next features is you would click, if you click an image, he zooms in and makes it a 2D preview in full resolution, kind so of this, seamlessly in the 3D view. This projection you're doing now, um, the matching 
to global coordinates, is that being done solely from the data from the autopilot? Yeah. Yeah. Or is that being done using the image data to match up no. against, for example, no. Google Earth or similar? No, Where's the... not, not. It's purely metadata. And for that right. reason, it just takes you one second or two seconds. So this preview is incredibly right. fast. Right. Um, yeah. And that's why there's some errors as well. Yeah, yeah, sure. But it's uh, the question is, how good is good enough? If you yeah. want to get a good, better preview, if you see, if I now have enabled filters based on a polygon, uh, if I move my mouse around, you see the background computes kind of, let's say, half a second, quarter of a second. So this is the amount of time we need for computing such a, such a stitching. And it only works because we just entirely rely on the metadata. Right, yeah. Now, can you adjust, I mean, height information is often a, a bit off, uh, depending if they've had a, you know, RTK fix. Is there a way you can sort of do a global height adjustment or or any other sort of global adjustments for for errors um aha yeah. uh -huh. well, now it's 100 meters higher okay yep but uh we are already also here we're doing some tricks in the background um we Yeah, we kind of averaging over the entire flight plan. You typically have a barometric height and a GPS height. And uh, we try to compensate them against each other and try to find out, so what is the height at your takeoff point? Try to match that with Google Maps or with whatever map we have, and then automatically adjust certain uh, global offsets. So with the, with the so, matching against the takeoff point, the problem is that you might be on some structure. I mean, Google Earth doesn't, it's, yeah. it's dam is you know, not yeah. great. That, um, that, that, is, that is the reason why you can adjust it. But let's say this automatic uh, add on uh, uh, offset estimation works quite well for, let's say something like uh, for whatever you mixed up ellipsoidal heights and geodial heights yeah. and, and things like that. Yeah. Can you choose um, which geoid it's using? Yep. As, uh, as I said in the beginning, you can go here. Right. Okay, um, great. Through tens of thousands of coordinate systems. Yeah. Um, we, uh, so in, I, I'm not sure. I think in the end, we, we had somewhere code where you can even load um, like really geoids, uh, like local geoids with high resolution. The problem is with those, um, as far as I know, there's not a really good standard file format for it. So we are, yeah, uh, that's, that's an open thing. And if you're going really in surveying, a lot of people ask for that, but it's a special corner case, but some specialists are really crying for that. But I think, at the end, it doesn't really matter for flight planning. You have to get it right in photogrammetry and processing. But here it's fine if you're off by a meter, if you're flying at 100 meter heights or on 50 meter heights. Oh, it's mostly sort of WGS84 versus, you know, AMSL sort of thing. Um, that's the most common. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, the, the typical like U-Blocks GPS can provide both. And then IG Pilot's got to pick which one it's going to be based around. Um, so we're just going to make sure that that default, you know, matches up with uh, what OMC yeah, does. Yeah. yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so here afterwards, you can even get some statistics. And also here you have warnings like, oh, auto coverage is not perfect, which is true since I modified the polygon way beyond its original mission area. Um, you can get the coverage, he can tell you how many images are passing your filter. You can even do manually filtering like, okay, altitude um, is currently between 38 and 41 meters, but I can, I don't know, do a filter on uh, 40 meters uh, plus minus one meter, then he's removing even more images. So you can filter if you really want to. And at the end, you can export it to a couple of softwares like CSV, metadata, writing back. We have integrated, uh, let me show you, where is it? So we've integrated uh, MetaShape, Context Capture, and Pix4D. 
Uh, we even integrated some automatic upload for Intel processing services, which I guess got deprecated over time. But in principle, you can upload it to the Intel Geospatial. Um, and for Argus of Metashape, we even have our own Python plugin within Argus of Metashape, where we're doing a lot of RTK optimization through um, running through the data set a couple of times, doing filterings to, to really tweak the uh, accuracy. That was one of the tricks we did with Sirius uh, in the past, how we tweaked the RTK accuracy by just doing very smart filtering with some Photoscan. And even that Python script and plugin will get released, but at the moment, they are not compatible with um, the newest version of Metashape, but I guess it's just a couple of hours fixing as soon as we have time for that. Um, yeah, so much about data sets. You can merge multiple data sets. You can um, yeah, process a lot of them at once. I, th I think uh, okay, somewhere there we stopped, stopped doing the work, but in principle, it's at least there was some planning for doing that. It was capable with MaVinci desktop beforehand. Um, yeah, next, what I would like to show you is open mission control um, and what we do for MapLink. Uh, before that, any question about flight planning or data sets? Oh, hi, Marco. Hi. Uh, in the beginning, you, you showed uh, the, some profiles with constraints regarding the camera and some things about the aircrafts. Yes. Do you have any kind of constraints, constraints regarding the flight endurance? How to break a flight plane to merge two flight planes in, or split in two, two flights or battery so, um, endurance stuff? So we, at the moment, there's just like a uh, max, it's part of the drone description max flight time, so you can't find it right now. Somewhere here should be a maximum flight time. Okay. Um, and we are only warning if it gets too long. Um, we, we had a lot of wireframes uh, drawn how to automatically split it up and what to do there, but that's not yet integrated. So there's also no coding around it. We had something like that before from a Vinci desktop. Um, especially for, let's say, big fixed wing flight plans, large polygons. And what we learned there is if you're splitting it up before you actually go to the field, it's actually a stupid idea. So our planning was more into a direction, we called it agile flight planning or something like that. So you're planning a, a, a big polygon and just making, let's say, a preliminary breakup with some estimation and doing it slightly too large for a single battery. Then you're doing your first flight, then you basically got, got the log files in, see what you actually covered. And then the next, the remaining flights are newly computed based on what's left over and not on your last planning. So after each flight, you replan from, because what we saw, like if you go to the real world, either you're planning with a lot of buffer then you, it takes you way too long, or you're planning without buffer, and then you wait, very often can't do the flights because you plan to have a takeoff location there, and then there's a tree in your way, you have no line of sight, or there is some water. And so this planning ahead of time without being there was very often, you have to be so conservative that it's actually possible. And so what we, and we did it that way, and our plans for redoing it was yeah, we call it agile flight planning. So we have all the concepts in our mind, but not yet coded. No, no, sure, sure. Just, just adopt because I was wondering about the 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 cylinder that you showed that you can map map. No, you take photos against an AI structure. So it's almost everything is so close. You just need to go around, go down, change the battery stuff like that. Mm. Okay. Yeah, but let's say how we did it at Intel is like we exported a really large flight plan to the drone, and then the pilot paused that flight plan, swapped batteries, and continued that flight plan. So from Intel mission control perspective, it was just one. In the real world, it was several. Um, okay. But you could. Okay. No. It. Sure. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. So. Um, I have ten minutes left, so let me start up. Open uh, the, the timing isn't strict, by the way. So if you go a bit over, that's absolutely fine. Okay. I 
Why is it not starting up? Uh, you need to close IMC <laughs> oh, <laughs> before right. you can. Yeah. Yeah, it checks if it's already running and then. OK. So what we did yesterday is getting a lot of uh, old, let's say, public available libraries back into the repository. So it's somehow starting. Uh, what's still missing is a resource folder with all strings and all icons and whatever, but we will get there. So um, let's start a random, ah, by the way, random flight plan. So you see here, is, there's now geofencing included, um, way more artwork we did. Um, we have different operation levels in the software. Maybe let me do that quickly. Yay, Overlord. Let, let me be Overlord. Um, let's do a new mission. Let's say, okay. First of all, you see there's a lot of DJIs in here uh, Intel drones, Sirius, the Marinci drones. And I think we even played with unique drones. Um, so, where's the windmill? Anyway, let's go with the polygon. No, yeah, also see that if you're doing a too large polygon, he wants you like, it's too large, I won't do a flight plan. Um, anyway, what I really wanted to show you is we have not only the planning button, not only the data set button, but something in between. We are calling the flight tab. <laughs> um, since I have no drone available here, let me connect to a mocked drone. Um, yeah, it's still 3D, but the drone is somehow hovering in the air. Um, so we have something like a dashboard with the most important parameters. On some of them, you can click to get a chart. Uh, this thing's starting to shine orange or even blinking red if they got on certain warning ranges. All those warning ranges you can define on the drone level and the specification files. You can select emissions, you can have automatically and manual pre-flight checks, all these warnings and fix me concept you saw from the flight planning, we also encountered in the flight execution tab. Um, in the flight planning, you can use your drone as your GPS, like um, please put the center of the drone, uh, of the tower, five meters in front of the current drone location. So you can do something like that. If you're out there in the field, want to do your planning and you have no good map, you can just use your drone for georeferencing, whatever you're planning. And yeah, um, unfortunately, I can't show you a lot because I have no muffling um, simulation running here. So we tested it already with PX4, I think several different drones, uh, including our own. We tested it with uh, some other pilot drones. Um, I wouldn't say it's perfect, but it's good enough. We also have a uh, live video support in here. You can get something like uh, a preview of the video collection in the lower corner based on, uh, then what was it? Do you remember what library? What's Anton was doing it? Oh, never mind. Um, yeah, um, you can have manual pre flight checklists which are specific for different drones. So, what should you do for this drone to actually take off? Um, automatically check results failed. Yeah, there's no drone available. Um, yeah, there's uh, the visualization here. You can do something like stay on the drone, centered, have the perspective out of the cockpit of the drone. Um, you can switch the map from 2D to 3D, um, do a lot of nice things. You can measure on the map. Um, yeah, and is there, I thought we should be. So in principle, there's also something like windmill flight planning. It's way more primitives here. You can add no fly zones manually if they're not coming from your data provider like AirMap. You can even manually include them. He's not automatically avoiding them in planning, but at least he warns you. The next step would be automatically avoiding flying into the no fly zone. And then if he has to maybe shoot into the no fly zone from the outside, that would, was all on the next list. And yeah, so coding wise for us next would be getting the remaining files, 
getting it running from IntelliJ is the first thing. And then next, getting a command line version compiling so you get an installer can actually run the software. And if we have, let's say, a software you can just install without a development environment around it, if that is achieved, then we're super, super open to cleanup and to feature improvements and to whatever. But I think that should happen first. Getting yeah, it usable completely for agree. everyone. Yeah. yeah, get it building, get it in CI as well. Um, yeah, so that it yeah, can right. build. Thank you. Uh, GitHub Actions is our preferred CI. We also use yeah. Semaphore, but generally we're moving most things to GitHub Actions. And um, so getting sort of every commit and, and branch and PR and things, um, and at least some, preferably with some testing, but uh, even just getting it to build in CI would be a great, great step. But, uh, you know, testing, automatic testing would be lovely as well, but it's difficult with a, a UI-based system like this. It's a it's somewhat of a challenge. Um, but, um, and then, uh, you know, c connecting it into RG Pilot software in the loop simulation, um, that would be really valuable because that would allow people in the community to try it. And um, the question is sort of which SITL we should use um, we've got lots of different physics backends that IG Pilot supports. Um, the, the ideal one would be like an immersive 3D one, which gives you an open world so you can actually simulate at the location you are on the planet. But such a one doesn't actually exist as far as I'm aware um, that, it, that provides any sort of, you know, halfway reasonable physics. Uh, there are some simulations based on Google Earth, but, um, you know, maybe something like that could be built but otherwise, even something like AirSim would be very useful, uh, maybe with some imported data for a couple of locations. And that way people can actually play with it around. Have you used AirSim at all? Have you played with it? Wasn't that the simulator we had at Mavinci? Or Cornelius was here. He maybe <laughs> you, You've used it and hate it? Or <laughs> what's that? Uh, that was, um, what was it called? JSB Sim. So in, in principle, oh, yeah. um, you don't need a user interface on the simulator because open mission control gives you that already so if you have a simulator that's command line only um that's basically enough because it will render the drone within the 3d world in yeah. open mission control anyway yeah, so uh, yeah. what i'm talking about is something a little bit more immersive than that if i if i pop it into the chat here uh there's a link to rg pilot with air sim and if you if you open that up and just click on the main video there, you'll see the type of um, you know immersive graphics and things and simulation of cameras and stuff that you have with with AirSim. Um, and but it is very resource intensive as you can imagine that sort of graphics. Um, and but it does you know you can do things like you know towers and power lines and all these sort of things and actually. Yeah. Um, but it, it might be not many of our users run SIM because it's so resource intensive. You need a really fast computer to run it at all decently. Um, and also the, the data packages, which actually provide those environments, they're commercial. And so, yeah, there's yeah. Um, only some but, of them are available. But, but on the other hand, I mean, we already have a full 3D environment. You can load yep. whatever world extension you want inside. So yep. what we did at Mavinci, um, which is kind of removed from uh, intermission control, but should be able to get it back really easily, is that you um, basically, um, the software partially knows that it connects to a simulation and then is adding some additional simulation control buttons like mm -hmm. reset simulation, right. move Speed simulation on the other yeah. end of the globe, yeah. selecting the hardware for the simulation, like or adding, what is the simulation time factor? Like, should it be two times real time? Because if you want to simulate a five hours flight time, it could get really boring. Yeah. So maybe you want yeah. to speed it up. Yeah, so yeah. we often like run that. high speed ups. Yes. Yeah. So things like that, we, we had back then Marinci desktop and our, that was even part of the, of the hardware drone environment. So yeah. instead of connecting to the drone, you could connect to a simulation and play it with yourself so really really low level simulation is already included in open mission control as i showed you he is computing the trajectory of the drone and then checking for collisions and things like yeah. that but yeah. it's really really bare limited 
And on the other hand, yeah, it, it simulates you a three hours flight plan, plan in half a second on a single core. It's good, it's good enough for checking for collisions with it's, airspaces. Flight it's more for um, digging into the interactions between the navigation control inside IG Pilot. If you, I don't know if you got a chance to see Leonard's talk earlier about S curves and the, the navigation stuff. If, if you haven't seen it, it's probably worth having a look at the video okay. we've got up of his talk. Um, because it's going to be really important that um, that OMC knows exactly how to get Argy Pilot to track the path that it wants, and yeah, yeah, and I, not produce any sort of uh, you know unwanted artifacts like flying yeah, through a balcony yeah. or whatever. Uh, no, I, I totally agree. Also, you have to train your pilots, you have to train your software, you have yeah. to check if all the user interface runs properly, and you don't want to crash a real drone each time you're adding a new control button, which might not work. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. We spend a lot of time. We've got a whole bunch of different simulation environments we, we work with in IG Pilot, and they're all basically based on, you know, running the real IG Pilot just compiled as a binary running on your desktop. Yeah. Uh, and then yeah. talking to a whole bunch of different physics backends. So, and, yeah. yeah. So basically, in a, in, a, in a perfect environment, I would even suggest let's bundle such a simulator and such an Arduino pilot with open mission control. So yeah. you don't have to start anything separately. You just click a button. Yeah. Well, that's, that's what we've got in Mission properly. Planner. Have you seen the, the simulation button in Mission Planner? Um, I used mission planner honestly only very very little yeah no worries I, I um so if there's a button for simulation and then you can pick the type of with a fixed wing copter rover submarine whatever helicopter and it then automatically we uh we automatically build binaries um for sigwin on our build server and they get downloaded automatically by the ground station by mission planner and then launched and then you can then fly against that. So um, OMC could pull the same binaries um, and we could also auto-generate binaries for other platforms um, if you, you know, did extend beyond Windows. And that would give you a way, it's a very cheap binary. Um, the IG Pilot binary running in SIDL, uh, running at normal speed really consumes very little CPU. So you can basically have it, and it doesn't require a UI, you can just have it as a child on a string as a process and then you can connect to it across with Mavlink and then you've got yourself a drone um, and or multiple. You can do you know, a bunch of them if you want to and launch a bunch if you wanted to do some swarming or something. But I, I think that might be you know, next year, year after, perhaps not, <laughs> not straight up. Actually, yes, but, sure. I mean, you all know Intel. We did a lot of light shows yep, with thousands of drones. Indeed, so it was yes. obviously that we also thought about getting more than one drone into the software. Yep. But we, the first goal was getting one drone in and also the entire design goals for the software was, um, it was always a competition between let's get it as user friendly as possible and as shiny as possible. Mm. And on the, like not for let's say developers, but on the other hand, it was very focused on yeah, our typical customer base, which have been people doing commercial inspection or mapping flights all day mm. long. and. Mm. You see, there are so many special parameters like tweaking orientation of camera angles, and that's all what they asked for. But yeah. the, still, the design goal was you should never ever edit many waypoints. We edit yeah. at the end, but we edit it very late. Normally, you, you should not do that. The other thing I think is going to be incredibly worthwhile to do fairly early on is to be able to run both Mission Planner and OMC at the same time against the same vehicle and uh, both in simulation and against real vehicles. So for example, yeah. you could take to get the simulation, they could launch it using, you know, the familiar technique of pressing the simulation button in Mission Planner, and then it would forward the Mavlink stream yeah. to OMC. Um, and that means people who, it will mean, it'll be yeah. less scary for people starting out trying OMC because they've still yeah. got their familiar interface. They know how to fly it, they know, they know all the buttons, et cetera. And, uh, but they've got this additional capability um, yeah. in the form of OMC. And uh, that's something that I think we have to make sure works really well and seamlessly um, um, running them so, in, in parallel. So in principle, we already tried that. So our entire development cycle was based on, um, was it a Q ground control? QGC, yeah. Kind of all the time together with, with intermission control. 
and also several intermission controls connecting at the same time to the same drone. So that was always a design goal. Mm. And I think we even did, I don't know, five, 10 ish flights with uh, mission control plus uh, intermission control. Um, uh, yep. So, um, yeah, that, that should run already. I'm not sure if the buttons we are. We just need to make it, make it slick and very easy to launch and easy yes, to maintain that this, link. This, yeah. This is very easy. We have to check uh, the coexistence, but I think we are already at least either almost or we are already there. So at least we did that all the time. And um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there'll be a few little bits and pieces worth doing. Sure. For example, picking the Mavlink source ID, uh, maybe using a different ID to Mission Planner so they can separate out the the commands, of mission upload, download, that sort of thing. Um, we've also got some new features coming up for much faster mission upload and download, uh, which would be great to take advantage of. So um, yeah, lots of exciting things to try. Yeah. Yeah, you see here we have auto discovery for, for all the drones and different connection types. So yes, I'm I'm also excited to see how that will, will work out. Yep. So any other question? Otherwise, I would let you continue in your schedule. No more questions at all. Well, I do I do have one small announcement to make. And uh the, the IG Pilot dev team held a, a vote over the last week about uh, bringing Marco in as our newest dev team member. And the vote was successful. So uh, you have been voted in as a IG Pilot dev team member, Marco. And uh, so welcome. And it's, uh, it's great to have someone with such experience you know, with the software coming in. Um, and uh, so really delighted to have you present this evening. And uh, it's fantastic to see these, these sort of capabilities coming into IG Pilot. And I, I saw there was some excitement on the live stream on YouTube about the sort of capabilities that's coming up. Uh, so thank you so much and really look forward to working with you in the coming months to, to bring this out to the community. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks for inviting me. And I, I hope that will be a lot of fun and hope that it can get more of the uh yeah people from the old team working on it jan was here kind of at the beginning he's seems to be really excited so thank you jan fantastic uh, i guess there's also more people to come and yeah i saw here in the chat what are your plans to get it working after what are your future plans i think a bit maybe you can answer that one question so sure. after we get it working we will all do the competitive stuff you do like integrating it in your ecosystem cleaning up the the mess cleaning up the build system externalizing some of the stuff we did like we have an old NASA whirlwind fork which we want to contribute back to the whirlwind community and pulling their latest resources so this is more technical stuff i think on the feature level um yeah I, well, what i'm really excited about is getting young's uh, 3d flight planning in there mm -hmm. and then maybe doing this agile flight planning stuff and then i don't know all this let's say the integration between planning and drone connection that was kind of added at the end but it's oh, it's an unfinished business you know what i mean so like this this uh, agile planning what i just mentioned like you you're doing just a part of the mission and then you doing the planning afterwards iteratively so that would be cool to see it in real life so we we spend so many hours discussing and thinking about it and I think most of us are quite confident that this is the right way to do it. And I'm, I'm happy to every discussion and to being, and also I'm happy to get proven wrong. So if everyone, anyone has an opinion on that, please join us on our Discord channel and I'm, I'm happy to work with you. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Marco. Uh, it's a really marvelous presentation. And, and thank you, Jan, for coming along uh, and Cornelius. And uh, so really great to see you all and look forward to working with you uh, on the OMC Dev channel. And we've got, of course, the, the Wednesday evening, my time, which is Wednesday morning, your time dev calls, which is supposed to be a European friendly time. But uh, hopefully we'll be able to, to have many more chats in the future. Thank you. And I will try to make it to your planning meeting later this day. But uh, as I mentioned, I have to go to COVID testing. With That's family. fine. No worries yeah. at all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Right. Bye.
All right, so up next we have Matt Kerr. I'll just take a second to switch over the video 